sacrifice unto the Lord. And as we know, he didn't, he didn't do that part of it. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, command me, when shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy house? that they, should, that they re, may remain in the river only. And so what Moses said to Pharaoh was, when do you say the frog should be gone? When do you say? And Pharaoh, now I still don't understand why he said this. Why didn't he say today? <laughs> why didn't he say right now? Right now. He said tomorrow. Tomorrow. That's what he said. And, of course, that's a whole other uh, sermon right there. Why, why put off till tomorrow what you can do today? Um, but, and he said, be it according to thy word. Be it according to thy word. And so tomorrow was when the frogs died. And they, they, you know, they swept them all up in heaps and blah, blah, blah. You, I'm sure you know the rest of the words. But it, it's very important to know that the plague was stopped according to the word of Pharaoh, who wasn't even an Israelite. Because words have power. Okay? When I was a child... Believe it or not, I do remember those days from time to time. When I was about four years old, we had, um, uh, we had a visitor. My, my grandmother from Mississippi came, and I was helping her carry uh, laundry upstairs from the basement. And I'm not quite sure exactly how this happened, but I fell up the stairs, and there, there's like a metal rim on our stairs, and I cut over my eye and had to have five stitches. I was probably four, five years old. I wasn't in school yet. And because I had this huge love for westerns and horses and riding and shooting and all this stuff, my entire family called me Calamity Jane. Calamity Jane. Now, did my family mean that in a bad way? Absolutely not. But this person right here, before she was 10, had slit both her wrists going through a plate glass window. I'd had four broken ankles, at least six sprained ones. I sat on a lawn chair one time, and it just so happened that... Um, the, the uh, bolts were broken between the, the rods to hold the chair together, and I sat on my finger, flipped off my fingernail, broke it, in three, in, and had to have stitches in my finger. Playing hockey, I was high-sticked and, and got my two front teeth, uh, the bottoms of them, knocked out. Um, in other words, and so this is what everyone would say. Well, there's Calamity Jane again. Calamity Jane did it again. Calamity Jane did it again. And I was called this until I was probably 19 or 20 years old. And do you want to know something? As soon, and no one, I never asked anyone to quit calling me that. They didn't do it trying to keep me heard. I mean, I can wrap anything. I can wrap your elbow. I broke my wrist. I mean, the list of things that I did to myself is quite extensive <laughs> or that were done to me. But um, once they stopped calling me Calamity Jane, I stopped having calamities. That is powerful. You don't call somebody something that you don't want them to be. So if you have a child, and I'm just using a, a real almost non thing, you don't call them a little stinker. You don't call them a snot. 
You don't say to a person or an adult or, and I've been called some pretty severe names in my day um, by some pretty old or, you know, I mean, I've been called pretty much everything. You, you're not raised as an independent woman and don't, don't, don't get called about every name in the book. And that's what I was raised as, and that's what I am, and I, I know that God made me this way, but you take a lot of hits. Yeah, and you take a lot of verbal hits. And as you become uh, in the Word, and I'm not saying that to feel sorry for me, Annie. I'm thankful for who I am. But you have to learn how to quench the fiery darts so that they don't penetrate you like Calamity Jane did to me when I was a little girl. And so the words of Pharaoh are important because he spoke and what he said happened. So now we're going to move on to the admonition of God concerning words. We're going to move to Proverbs chapter 6. We'll read verse 2. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Some translations say you become a captive of the words of your mouth. And we see in today's world how fear has made people a captive. Fear, uh, I, I am afraid to trust anyone. I am afraid if I don't lock my doors. I am afraid to do this or do that. I am afraid for my children to go out of the house. I am afraid for my money to be gone. Whatever, you know, I don't have enough for retirement. I don't have whatever. Fear. It is the reason the enemy exists is to give us fear. So we move to Proverbs chapter 8, and we also start with verse 6. Hear, for I will speak of excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things, for my mouth shall speak truth. And wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteousness. There is nothing crooked or perverse in them. That is what our goal is. No, no, I'm not there. <laughs> I, I'm moving there. God willing, I'm closer to that today than I was last year at this time. So we're moving toward this. But this isn't, I'm not standing up here saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm never going to say anything wrong. <laughs> because that'll have, that, that right there is wrong. So now we're going to go to the New Testament. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 15. And this is New Testament power of our word. So this is when Jesus was here on the earth. What he said our words did. If we go to chapter 15, verse 11. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, that is what defiles a man. It's not what you eat that defiles you. It's what you say. When I was a little girl, my mother used to say, pretty is as pretty does. And so you can have a beautiful woman with an ugly mouth, and they're not pretty. You can have a handsome man with an ugly mouth, and they are not a handsome person. If we move down to verse 17, 
Do you not yet understand that whatever entereth in at the mouth goes into the stomach and is cast into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. You know, Jeremiah said, I don't have the scripture down for you, but Jeremiah said that our heart is deceitfully wicked. And so we have to guard our heart. We have to purify our heart. We have to cleanse our heart so that the things in our heart come out of our mouth and they're good things. They're good things. And um, so now we'll move to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. He's talking to Peter at this point. I, and I will give you, unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Do you know that he did not say here only good things? So your words can bind and loose bad as well. And that is, that is probably the thing that like a spider web has bound us all up is the the binding and lo- the binding of ourselves by the idle careless or unword words that we have spoken so now we'll move to chapter 18 of Matthew still and we'll read verse 18 verily i say unto you Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And so we have the power to loose evil with our mouth. We can loose good or evil. And here is an example of that. I, I did ask Ronnie's permission before I told this story. I will. I want you to know it's not, not about Ronnie personally. But when, um, oh, probably in the 80s is when they coined the word Alzheimer's disease. They hadn't called it Alzheimer's until the 80s. And my father would say, I've got Eisenhower's disease. <laughs> And, of course, he didn't say Alzheimer's. And so my dad never had any mind or memory issues. And today, I thank God that my dad never said Alzheimer's. He would say Eisenhower's. (laughs) Ronnie's dad, on the other hand, when he retired, people would say to him, Are you retired? And Ronnie's father would say, no, I'm retarded. Guess who got Alzheimer's? Ronnie's dad. And you think that these words that you say are a joke or flippant or cool or, or um, um, uh, making friends or or sociable these words that you say are life and death and my dad's words in that particular instance were life ronnie's dad's were death now let's go to again we've been here before mark 11:23 For verily I say unto you, whosoever shall say unto this mountain. So he says, say to the mountain. And Genesis 1.1, we said, and God said, 
Genesis 1, verse 26, he gave us dominion for us to say. Mark eleven twenty three, 23, he said to us, say to that mountain. Ronnie goes, uh, um, Ronnie has learned some things from um, um, a pastor, and he says, say what you want to see. Don't say what you see. Say what you want to see. Because if we are just saying what we see, we are agreeing with the natural world that we live in. If we are saying what we don't see, we are moving into the supernatural. And that's where we want to live, right? So what you say is important. So let's move over to John chapter 14. And I encourage you uh, when we get to John chapter 15 to sometime read the whole chapter because it's, it, really, it really gives a fabulous relationship about how we're to abide in Jesus and he abides in us. And, 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 uh, but we're not going to go into that part of it today. But John 14, we'll start with verse 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And so he is talking to someone that actually wants to use the things of God for good. So we'll move over to chapter 15, and we'll read just verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. So if you're abiding in him, if you are getting your nourishment from him, his words will abide in you. And so now we're going to move to James. James chapter 3. I'm going to read it to you out of the Passion. Because this was, this was excellent, the way that it was written here. James, as you know, was a pastor. Jesus had died. We are now in the early church age. And so James is like the pastor of pastors. And he was instructing on things that were coming up or whatever he saw, whatever God was leading him to write. And so this is what he wrote, beginning in verse 1, about the tongue in the passion. My dear brothers and sisters, so he's talking to us, people of God. Don't be so eager to become a teacher in the church since you know that we who teach are held to a higher standard of judgment. We all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet, if we're able to bridle the words we say, we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. If we can control our words, we can control ourselves in every way. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. Horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body. And the same with mighty ships. Though they are massive and driven by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, yet it carries great power. Just think of how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze. And the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body, the tongue. The most dangerous part of our human body is the tongue. 
It corrupts the entire body and is a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn through the course of human existence. For every wild animal on earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of the sea and land, have all been overpowered and tamed by humans. But the tongue is not able to be tamed. It's a fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. We use our tongues to praise God, our Father, then turn around and curse a person who was made in his very image. Out of the same mouth, we pour out words of praise one minute and curses the next. My brothers and sister, this should never be. This should never be. What is he saying here? He is saying that we cannot control our tongue. But we know someone who can. We have to give our tongue to God. To God. That is the only way that we have any opportunity to stop this mouth from spewing out toxic poison and hurting those we love and those we want to win to Jesus. That's it. It's our only choice. And believe you me, this is a hindrance to receiving healing because we pray for you and then in our sweetness how do you feel well I don't care how you feel Smith Wigglesworth used to say when someone would ask him how he felt he would say I don't ask my body how it feels I tell it how it's gonna feel and so do you say I'm old, I'm tired. Everything falls apart after 50. I'm sick. I don't feel good. I don't want to. Well, you know, it's going around. And when someone says that to me, under my breath, not to offend them, I say it's going right around me. It can go right around me. When someone says, take care, I don't offend them by saying, I don't take care, blah, blah, blah. I cast my care. I say to them, thank you for your concern. Thank you for your concern. We're not, we're not, we're not to become the word police <laughs> unless we're policing ourselves. We hear things like, I can't ever get ahead. If it's not one thing, it's another. That dress is to die for. We negate the good words and promises of God by the things that we say. This country is going to hell in a handbasket. I don't even really know what that means. I don't know what the handbasket is. I don't even know. But I've heard that saying my entire life. This country is going to hell in a handbasket. And so, so we have to remove. You won't hear me, except for right now, say that I'm a senior. I'm aging. I have more years than I had last year. And I'm going to live to be 120 but you will not see me ask for a senior discount because I am not a senior to God. When I become 100, you can call me a senior, but not until I get to be 100 because I don't want to relate to that. I remember 
I know I tell a lot of stories about my dad because my dad was really a character. And, um, but I remember I, he was about 75 years old. And um, every Tuesday night, uh, we lived in Florida. There was a Christian, uh, there was a roller skating rink, and they um, had Christian roller skating on Tuesday night. They played all Christian songs. So all the kids would go out, and of course, I would go out. I was 30, whatever. I didn't care. And so my dad said one night, my best friend and I, we went every Tuesday, and my dad said one night, well, honey, I haven't roller skated in a long time. Uh, how about you take me? And, uh, well, okay. <laughs> so we get him over there to the roller rink. We spend about 45 minutes getting the, sh the skates on, you know, and getting him just to where he's happy with how they're laced and blah, blah, blah. It was a wooden, a wooden rink. Thank you, Jesus. And so we get Dad, we get Dad out um, on the roller rink about, oh, maybe from here to Pastor Lonnie. And all of a sudden he, bam! right back on the on the on the on the uh, his head bounces off the floor of the rink he's laying there like this he starts laughing he goes honey i think we can scratch this off the list of things i can still do <laughs> and that was how he lived his life he, he, and my girlfriend and i are dragging him off the rink you know <laughs> and that's how he lived his life and he didn't whine and cry and, and have a hissy fit every time things didn't go his way. He just lived it. And, um, and he, was, he was a lot of fun. We, we, had, we had a lot of fun times with Dad. And, um, but that's how God wants us to be. I'm, you know, I don't care how old I am. I'll still go snow skiing. I'll still ride horses. I'll still ride bicycles. I'll still do the things that I enjoy doing because I have life. And I do not have to let my age, the number of years that I have become, restrict me. Because I am not going to bind myself with my words. I'm too old for that. I hear that all the time. I'm too old for that. I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to be. And, um, and so we go from there. What does the word want you to say? What does the word want you to say? We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Verse 19 and 20 is what we'll read. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. It's your choice. I'm going to choose life. You can choose whatever you want, but I'm going to choose life. I'm going to choose blessing so that both me and my seed may live. That I may know love, that I may love the Lord my God. And that I will obey his voice. And I will cleave to him, for he's my life. That's what it says. And the length of my days that, he, that I will dwell in the land that he gave me. He gave me. He gave me the home I live in. I am living on the land that God gave me. So now let's go to Colossians. We're almost done, I promise. Chapter 3, we'll start with verse 12. And the reason that all of this is in our healing lessons is because our words stop 
the processes of the healing of God. They stop them. And as we've said before, if your faith is go to the doctor, go to the doctor. We're going to believe with you that the doctor <clears throat> will have the wisdom of God and do what is necessary. We are not a church that cares how you get your healing. We just want you to get it. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. What does the song say? Uh, Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. That is what we are talking about, is believing God to make us strong when we are weak. We have all been weak, and we have all needed God to make us strong. And so we're going to close with the last verse. And this is actually a prayer that I pray regularly for myself. Just one little verse. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Let's pray.